I think it's fair to say that the changes have been quite uh, dramatic. As I alluded to in uh, some of my videos, uh, in the old days, and I'm old enough to remember this very well, the Philadelphia post ALL was the worst subgroup of leukemias um, in terms of prognosis. And in fact, I often tell the uh, younger generation it probably was the worst cancer you could get because the prognosis was extremely poor. And not only in adults, I should say also in children, it was uh, unfavorable. The only chance of cure in those days was an allogeneic uh, stem cell transplant when doable. Now in adults, obviously this is more complicated, uh, particularly because the Philadelphia post ALL, uh, the incidence increases with age. As I said in one of my other uh, videos, this uh, goes up to a high proportion in the elderly, about one out of two of ALL patients, of B-lineage ALL patients over the age of 50, 60, have carried the BCR ableson. So this makes it a very, a very frequent occurrence in the less young patients. So what has been the turning point in ALL has been introduction of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And I must say that over the years, and I'm talking about more than 15 years, in fact, closer <clears throat> to 20 than 15, in Italy, in our national protocols, the GMEMA protocols, for the last this period of time, we have decided that we would induce patients, so treat them in induction only with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor with steroids. This means, going back to my other presentation, also that you need a rapid diagnostic workup in the sense that in, for the ALL, we give a one week of steroid prephase, and that week allows us a window during which we have time to identify whether the patient has or does not have the BCR ableton. Patients who have the BCR ableton, as I said, for uh, about 18 years, have been given a TKI in induction. And the first protocol was with imatinib for elderly patients over the age of 60. And in fact, it enrolled patients up to the age of 89, so certainly rather mature. And uh, to our surprise, I would say all patients went into remission. I'm not saying a cure, I said they went to dermatological remission. But that opened the way to carry out a number of studies where there were only TKIs and induction. And the bottom line was that the rate of myological remission was between 94 and 100% with virtually no death in induction. So this is the first point indicating that you can induce into remission patients with Philadelphia positive ALL over all ages, including elderly and very elderly, without systemic chemotherapy with a TKI alone and steroids. That I think that's rather consolidated. We've seen it with all the TKIs available. And then the last study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, at the end of last year, we reported data of the last study that the GMEMA completed, which were based on an induction again with the TKI, dasatinib, and steroids. But here we added the second phase, the consolidation was based on immunotherapy and was based on the use of the bispecific monoclonal antibody blinatumumab, which targets CD19 on the leukemic B cells, but activates a host immune system via the CD3. So it's a form of immunotherapy. So we, it's induction consolidation without systemic chemo with a targeted treatment followed by immunotherapy. So it's a, let's say quite a, uh, quite a different approach. And this protocol for all other patients, once again, without any uh, upper age limit. And uh, the results have been very positive with virtually all patients going into remission. But what was more important and what was in fact the primary endpoint of the study was to see how many patients could obtain a molecular response after two cycles of blinatumumab. And what we reported was that uh, at the end of the induction, we already had a proportion of patient molecular response, 29%, but this increased to significantly up to 60% with two cycles of blinatumor. So the primary end of the study was met. And I must say that to, to our surprise, because the protocol allowed a minimum of two cycles, but they could go up to five cycles of blina. And we found that with more cycles, we increased the rate of molecular response, went up to 70, 80%. The overall response obviously was very good. And I uh, say that the overall survival and disease for survival have been extremely good. And we've updated this information at the EHA Congress in June, 
And last week, in fact, at the Italian Society of Hematology and the data continue to look extremely positive with a high proportion of MAD of complete uh, molecular responses persisting over time. I can add in addition that even patients uh, um, who had, uh, we tested mutation of the B-cell labels on, on MRD positivity after induction and found it in, I think I remember by heart, I think in seven and in six of these, these were cleared by blinatumab, something we didn't know. So you can affect also a B-cell labels and enable some mutation, which is obviously relevant. Uh, we've also seen, and this again was something we didn't expect, that uh, blinatumab could activate the immune system of the patients. So we monitored over time uh, T regs, T cells, NK cells, and TNK, and we showed, and this was partly published in the first paper in the New England, but then it's been in a, published in another paper that appeared in Blood in July. And you can see that there's a decrease in T regulatory cell, T regs, which is good news. And there's an increase in CD8 positive cells, in T cells, in TNK cells, and in NK cells. And this is observed progressively after more cycles of blina. So there's something we didn't expect. So blina tumor, in addition to exerting an effect directly on the leukemic cells, also appears to be capable in vivo, different from in vitro, in vivo to modulate the immune system of the patient. And this is obviously another very important mechanism that could help to control the disease. And we showed in fact that this occurs also in patients over the age of 55. Again, relevant all this to what's considered maybe some patients in the future with this subgroup may be managed without chemo and even without transplant. And I can add that in fact, this has been addressed in the new GMMA protocol, which is open where if patients do not have additional genetic abnormalities at diagnosis, the so-called ECROS plus, which we showed in a study have a poor prognostic uh, outcome. If they don't have additional genetic abnormality, if the MRD is negative, repeatedly negative, these patients will not receive a transplant even if they have a sibling donor. So we hope to prove that at least a proportion of patients can be managed and possibly cured, even in Philadelphia post LL without systemic chemo and our transplant. After all, I mean, we've learned over the years the lessons in acute promyelocytic leukemia, where we know that we can cure many patients without systemic chemo. So who knows, this, which was the worst condition may in fact change and it may be much more manageable. This allows me once again to spend another couple of words to underline the role of laboratories which too often are not available, but this is a typical example. You need to diagnose them through the molecular marker. You need to monitor MRD and to decide how to treat. And, uh, and even for the abnormalities, I mean, if you want to test the abnormality, you need the genetic monitoring of the mutations of the Abelson and on the genetic landscape of the patient at diagnosis. So this is not easily doable everywhere. But by doing that, I think we can change a prognosis of Philadelphia positive ALL. And as I said, hopefully the proportion of patients would be managed without systemic chemo and without transplant. Mm -hmm.